Chapter Seven: Adventure at the Seaside. One morning, Mr. Brown tapped the barometer in the hall. It looks as if it's going to be a nice day," he said. "How about a trip to the sea?" His remark was greeted with enthusiasm by the rest of the family, and in no time at all, the house was in an uproar. Mrs. Bird started to cut a huge pile of sandwiches, while Mr. Brown got the car ready. Jonathan and Judy searched for their bathing suits, and Paddington went up to his room to pack. An outing which involved Paddington was always rather a business, as he insisted on taking all his things with him. As time went by, he had acquired lots of things, as well as his suitcase. He now had a smart weekend grip, with the initial P B, inscribed on the side, and a paper carrier bag for the odds and ends. For the summer month, Mrs. Brown had brought him a sun hat. It was made of straw. And very floppy. Paddington liked it, for by turning the brim up or down, he could make it different shapes, and it was really like having several hats in one. When we get to Bright Sea, said Mrs. Brown, we'll buy you a bucket and spade. Then you can make a sand castle. And you can go to the pier, said Jonathan eagerly. Day with some super machines, on the pier, you'd better bring plenty of coins, and we can go swimming," added Judy. "You can swim, can't you?" "Not really well, I'm afraid," replied Paddington. "You see, I've never been to the seaside before. Never been to the seaside." Everyone stopped what they were doing and stared at Paddington. "Never." Said Paddington. They all agreed that it must be nice to be going to the seaside, for the first time in one's life. Even Mrs. Bird began talking about the time she first went to Bright Sea. Many years before, Paddington became very excited as they told him all about the wonderful things he was going to see. The car was crowded when they started off. Mrs. Bird, Judy, and Jonathan sat in the back. Mr. Brown drove, and Mrs. Brown and Paddington sat beside him. Paddington liked sitting in the front, especially when the window was open, so that he could poke his head out in the cool breeze. After a minor delay. When Paddington's hat blew off on the outskirts of London, they were soon on the open road. Can you smell the sea yet, Paddington? Asked Mrs. Brown after a while. Paddington poked his head out and sniffed. I can smell something, he said. Well, said Mr. Brown, keep on sniffing because we are almost there. And sure enough. They had reached the top of the hill, and rounded a corner to go down the other side. There it was in the distance, glistened in the morning sun. Paddington's eyes opened wide. Look at all the boats on the dirt! He cried, it, pointing in the direction of the beach with a pow. Everyone laughed. That's not dirt," said Judy. That sand. By the time they had explained all about sand to Paddington, they were in Bright Sea itself, and driving along the front. Paddington looked at the sea rather doubtfully. The waves were much bigger than he had imagined. Not so big as the one he had seen on his journey to England, but quite large enough for a small bear. Mr. Brown stopped the car by the shop on the Esplanade, 
and took out some money. I'd like to fit this bear out for a day at the seaside, he said to the lady behind the counter. Let's see now, we shall need a bucket and spade, a pair of sunglasses, one of those rubber tires. As he reeled off the list, the lady handed the articles to Paddington, who began to wish he had more than two paws. He had a rubber tire round his middle, which kept slipping down around his knees. A pair of sunglasses perched precariously on his nose. His straw hat, a bucket and spade in one hand, and his suitcase in the other. Photograph, sir. Paddington turned to see an untidy man with a camera looking at him. Only one pound, sir. Result guaranteed. Money back if you're not satisfied. Paddington considered the matter for a moment. He didn't like the look of the man very much, but he had been saving hard for several weeks and now had just over three pounds. It would be nice to have a picture of himself. Won't take a minute, sir, said the man, disappearing behind a black cloth at the back of the camera. Just watch the birdie. Paddington looked around. There was no bird in sight as far as he could see. He went round behind the man and tapped him. The photographer, who appeared to be looking for something, jumped and they emerged from under his cloth. How do you expect me to take your picture if you don't stand in front? He asked in a grieved voice. Now I will waste the plate and he looked too shiftily at Paddington. That will cost you one pound. Paddington gave him a hard stare. You said there was a bird, he said. And there wasn't. I expect it flew away when you saw your face, said the man nastily. Now where my pound? Paddington looked at him even harder for a moment. Perhaps the bird took it when you flew away, he said. Ha ha, cried another photographer, who had been watching the proceeding with interest. Fancy you being taken in by a bear, Charlie. Serve see you right for trying to take photographs without a license. Now be off with your before I call a policeman. He watched while the other man gathered up his belongings and slouched off in the direction of the pier. Then he turned to Paddington. These people are a nuisance, he said, taking away the living from honest folk. You did quite right not to pay him any money. And if you will allow me, I'd like to take a nice picture of you myself as a reward. The Brown family exchanged glances. I don't know, said Mrs. Brown. Paddington always seemed to fall on his feet. That's because he's a bear, said Mrs. Bird darkly. Bears always fall on their feet. She led the way onto the beach and carefully laid out the traveling rug on the sand behind a breakwater. This will be as good a spot as any, he said. Then we shall all know where to come back to, and no one will get lost. The tide is out, said Mr. Brown, so it will be nice and safe for bathing. He turned to Paddington. Are you going in, Paddington? he asked. Paddington looked at the sea. I might go for a paddle, he said. Well, hurry up, called Judy, and bring your bucket and spade. Then we can practice making sand castles. Gosh, Jonathan pointed a notice pint on the wall behind them. Look, there's a sand cast competition. We saw. First prize ten pounds for the biggest sand castle. 
Suppose we all join in and make one, said Chidi. I bet the three of us together could make the biggest one you've ever seen. I don't think you're allowed to, said Mrs. Brown, reading the notice. It says here everyone has to make their own. Judy looked disappointed. Well, I shall have a go anyway. Come on, you two. Let's have a bath first. Then we can start digging after lunch. She raised it down the sand closely, followed by Jonathan and Paddington. At least, Jonathan followed, but Paddington only got a few yards before his light belt slipped down, and he went headlong in the sand. Paddington, do give me your suitcase, called Mrs. Brown. You can't take it in the sea with you. It will get wet and be ruined. Looking rather crestfallen, Paddington handed his things to Mrs. Brown for safekeeping and then ran down the beach after the others. Judy and Jonathan were already a long way out when he got there, so he contented himself with sitting on the water's edge of the while, letting the waves swirl around him as they came in. It was a nice feeling, a bit cold at first, but it soon got warm. He decided the seaside was a nice place to be. He paddled out to where the water was deeper, and they lay back in his rubber tire, letting the waves carry him gently back to the shore. Ten pounds, supposing, supposing he won ten whole pounds. He closed his eyes. In his mind, he had a picture of a beautiful castle made of sand, like the one he'd once seen a picture book, with battlements and towers and a moat. It was getting bigger and bigger, and everyone else on the beach had stopped to gather round and cheer. Several people said they had never seen such a big sand castle, and he woke with a start as he felt someone splashing water on him. Come on, Paddington, said Judy, lying there in the sun fast asleep. It's time for lunch, and we got to lots of work to do afterwards. Paddington felt disappointed. It had been a nice sand castle in his dream. He was sure he would have won first prize. He rubbed his eyes and followed Judy and Jonathan up the beach to where Mrs. Bird had laid out the sandwiches, ham, egg, and cheese for everyone else, and special marmalade ones for Paddington, with ice cream and fruit salad to follow. I vote, said Mr. Brown, who had in mind in after lunch net for himself, that after we've eaten, you all go off in different direction and make your own sand castles. Then we will have our own private competition, as well as the official one. I will give a pound to the one with the biggest castle. All three thought this was a good idea. But don't you go too far away, called Mrs. Brown, as Jonathan, Judy, and Paddington set off. Remember the tide is coming in. Her advice fell on Death's ears. They were all much too interested in sand castles. Paddington especially was gripping his bucket and spade in a very determined fashion. The beach was crowded and he had to walk quite a long way before he found a deserted spot. First of all, he dug a beam moat in a circle, leaving himself a draw bridge so that he could fetch and carry the sand for the castle itself. Then he set to work carrying bucket loads of sand to build the walls of the castle. He was an industrious bear, and even though he was hard work and his legs and paws soon got tired, 
He persevered until he had a huge pile of sand in the middle of his circle. Then he set to work with his spade, smoothing out the walls and making the battlement. They were very good battlements, with holes for windows and slots for the archers to fire through. When he had finished, he struck his spade in one of the corner towers, placed his head on the top of that, and then lay down inside next to his marmalade jar and closed his eyes. He felt tired but very pleased with himself. With the gentle lure of the sea in his ears, he soon went fast asleep. We've been all along the beach, said Jonathan, and we can't see him anywhere. He didn't even have his light belt with him, said Mrs. Brown anxiously. Nothing, just a bucket and spade. The Browns were gathered in a worried group round the man from the life-saving hut. He's been gone several hours, said Mr. Brown. And the tide's been in over two. The man looked serious. And you say he can't swim, he asked. He doesn't even like having a bath much, said Judy. So I'm sure he can't swim. Here's his photograph, said Mrs. Bird. He only had taken this morning. She handed the man Paddington's picture and then dabbed her eyes with the handkerchief. I know something's happened to him. He wouldn't have missed his tea unless something was wrong. The man looked at the picture. We could send out a description, he said dubiously. But it's a job to see what he looks like by that. It's all hat and dark glasses. Can't you launch a light boat? asked Jonathan hopefully. We could, said the man, if we knew where to look. But he might be anywhere. Oh dear, Mrs. Brown reached for her handkerchief as well. I can't bear to think about it. Something will turn up, said Mrs. Bird comfortingly. He's got a good hat on his shoulders. Well, said the man, holding up a dripping straw hat. You'd better have this. In the meantime, we will see what we can do. There, there, Mary, Mr. Brown held his wife's arm. Perhaps he just left it on the beach or something. It may have got picked up by the tide. He bent down to pick up the rest of Penton's belongings. They seemed very small and lonely lying there on their own. Is Paddington's head all right? said Judy, examining it. Look, it's got his mark inside. She turned the head inside out and showed them the outline of the paw marked in black ink and the words my head Paddington. I vote we all separate, said Jonathan, and comb and beach. We will stand the more chance that way. Mr. Brown looked dubious. It's getting dark, he said. Mrs. Bird put down the traveling rug and folded her arms. Well, I'm not going back until it's found, she said. I couldn't go back to the empty house, not without Paddington. No one's thinking of going back without him, Mrs. Bird, said Mr. Brown. He looked helplessly out the sea. It's just... Perhaps he didn't get swept out to the sea, said the life-saving man helpfully. Perhaps he's just gone on the pier or something. There seemed to be a big crowd heading that way. Must be something interesting going on. He caught out to a man who was just passing. Watch going on at the pier, chum. Without stopping, the man looked back over his shoulder and shouted. Chap just crossed the Atlantic all by itself on a raft. Hundreds of days without food or water, so they said. He hurried on. 
The life-saving man looked disappointed. Another of these publicity stunts, he said. We get 'em every year. Mr. Brown looked doubtful. I wonder, he said, looking in the direction of the pier. It would be just like him," said Mrs. Bird. "It's the sort of thing that would happen to Paddington. It's got to be," cried Jonathan. "It's got to be." They all looked at each other and then, picking up their belongings, joined the crowd hurrying in the direction of the pier. It took them a long time to force their way through the turnstile. For the news that something would happen on the pier had spread, and there was a great throng at the entrance. But eventually, after Mr. Brown had spoken to a policeman, a way was made for them, and they were escorted to a very end, where the paddle steamers normally tied up. A strange sight met their eyes. Paddington, who had just been pulled out of the water by a fisherman, was sitting on his upturned bucket, talking to some reporters. Several of them were taking photographs, while the rest fired a question at him. "Have you come all the way from America?" asked one reporter, the bronze hardly knowing whether to laugh or cry. Waited eagerly for Paddington's reply. Well, no," said Paddington truthfully. After a moment's pause, "Not America, but I've come a long way." He waved a paw vaguely in the direction of the sea. "I got caught by a tide, you know." And you sat in that bucket all the time," asked another man, taking a picture. "That's right." Replied Paddington, and I used my spade as a paddle. It was lucky I had it with me. Did you live on plankton? Queried another voice. Paddington looked puzzled. No, he said, mumbled. Mister Brown pushed his way through the crowd. Paddington jumped up and looked rather guilty. Now then, said Mister Brown. Taking his paw, that's enough question for today. This bear's been at sea for a long time, and is tired. In fact, he looked meaningfully at Paddington. He's been at sea all the afternoon. Is it still only Tuesday? Asked Paddington innocently. I thought it was much later than that. Tuesday said Mister Brown firmly. And we've been worried to death over you. Paddington picked up his bucket and spade and jar of marmalade. Well, he said, I bet not many bears have gone to the sea in a bucket all the same. It was dark when they drove along bright sea front of their way home. The promenade was festooned with colored lights. And even the fur tent in the gardens kept changing color. It all looked very pretty, but Paddington, who was lying in the back of the car wrapped in the blanket, was thinking on his sand castle. I bet mine was bigger than anyone else's, he said sleepily. Bet you mine was the biggest, said Jonathan. I think, said Mister Brown hastily. You'd all better have a pound just to make sure. Perhaps we can come again another day," said Mrs. Brown. "Then we can have another competition. How about that, Paddington?" There was no reply from the back of the car. Sandy Castles, paddling his bucket across the harbor, and the sea air had proved too much for Paddington. He was fast asleep.